Um, so he would celebrate the sexual unions of the flowers and he wouldn't shy away from the fact that many of these were not monogamous, for example, and so there were many, uh, many forms of sexual union in the plant world and very few of them were actually monogamous. So they weren't just, you know, um, kind of chaste versions of flowers. If anything, he went out of his way to celebrate the ones <laughs> that were the most promiscuous. Well, Erasmus Darwin, as a personal individual, um, was interested in sex and talked about sex in a way that 18th century people often did with much greater freedom than we do. And um, he was married, he had, he had lots of children, he had um, two illegitimate daughters as well who he looked after very well. He was also interested in sex because sex was a major characteristic that Carl Linnaeus had used for his new binomial classification of plants, which is still similar to the one that we have today. And what Linnaeus did, and he was much criticised for that, was he counted the number of stamens and pistils in a plant, the female and male uh, components of a flower, in order to classify them into different classes. So, so this sexual classification was very much at the heart of Linnaean botanic classification. And then there's a third meaning, uh, a third reason for associating sex with Erasmus Darwin, that in his first poem he wrote called The Loves of the Plants, it is very explicitly sexual. It's about the sexual attraction uh, with one central woman and a varying amount of met number of men who cluster around her. So there's all sorts of sexual connotations and metaphors that are, are pretty explicit. Moving on to the last plant he names, right at the end of The Loves of the Plants, that is the Adonis, or pheasant's eye, which is just a nice little field plant, doesn't look, sort of nice little red flower, doesn't look particularly amazing, but it's got lots going on in the centre of each flower, a lot of tendrils and um, he points out that they are a great many stamens and a great many pistils and so he says they're an example of polygamia, polygamous marriage and he ends the sequence there which helps to enforce the illusion that we've gone through systematically and mathematically from one to a hundred of each organ um, but what he does is something possibly a bit controversial, and it's, it's almost surprising. It wasn't seen as rather more radical and dangerous in, in early reviews. He links it to Tahitian society, as discovered by Captain Cook and um, Joseph Banks, who became Sir Joseph Banks, and was one of uh, a big friend and patron of Darwin's work. Uh, and the accounts from Cook and Ban Banks describe these orgies, basically, uh, by a particular group of Tahitians. Um, Darwin treats it very lightly. He just says it is Venus casting her net in a smiling, cheerful way over all of these happy people, and that's what the Adonis plant is like, and that's the end of the poem. It sounds a bit like a kind of um, a, a, an advocacy of free love and has been read by some critics, but as I said, it seemed to get away with it at the time. The, one of the reasons why the Linnaean classification initially seemed very shocking was precisely because he focused on the sexuality of plants. And in, um, British people in particular were appalled because botany was traditionally a subject that could be undertaken by women. And they found it completely inappropriate for women to be learning about the sexual organs of plants. That, uh, there were a lot of protests, especially by very religious people, that it was just completely improper. And they found all sorts of euphemistical words to, to try and get the sex out of Linnaean botany, but the sex was intrinsically there and there wasn't much that they could do about it. So Darwin's book was designed to make Linnaean botany acceptable to a female audience by dressing everything up in this guise of Greek goddesses. Uh, I mean, it means, reads like rather <laughs> mediocre soft porn to me, but it, it sold extremely, extremely well at the time. Rousseau was probably the person that led me to um, develop my interest in women in botany because he, um, most people know him as a kind of herbarizer or botanizer of the solitary walks, etc. Um, 
but not many people know the text Letters on the Elements of Botany addressed to a lady, which is the translation from Rousseau. And it was actually Thomas Martin who translated the letters in around about 1785. He was the person that translated Rousseau's letters uh, into English and in some ways feminised them as well because he emphasised that they were addressed to a lady in the translation. Um, and these, this was widely circulated and one, one of the things that I found absolutely remarkable and also fascinating was the fact that when I looked into this work I found that it's one of the best sellers in England for women at the time. Um, so rather than reading, well as, alongside reading novels, they were reading this work which is a translation of Rousseau um, on botanical letters I'd, and I, get, I just thought you know this kind of exemplifies for me um, women in the culture of botany but also just the sheer I suppose uh, popularity of botany for women at the time the fact that this was some kind of runaway bestseller and it was a work of, of botanical letters addressed to, to a lady so Rousseau was instrumental in feminizing it because within the letters um, it's a mother and daughter that exchange these botanical letters so really within the text uh, the mother figure um, is instructing her daughter in Linnaean botany through this exchange of letters. So it represents, I suppose, the kind of sociability involved in that sort of culture of botany for women. So what, what we can take from that is the notion that women were not necessarily closeting, closeting themselves away with books and specimens, but they were out in the fields botanising, uh, herborising, in the way that Rousseau understood botany. Um, and so they were taking botany out of, out of uh, I suppose, a laboratory into the outdoors, into the hedgerows, uh, and that was a very safe environment for women. So I suppose women's experiences of botany was very influenced by Rousseau's uh, outlook at the time. He wasn't too interested in uh, institutions and laboratories, and so his botanising took place outdoors. Um, I think that was highly influential for women's botany as well. Within, in, within England, there was somebody called William Withering who, had, uh, in, who was more well-known, really, than someone like Linnaeus. And he had uh, sort of anglicised Linnaean terms and in some ways um, what we might call fair sex them. <laughs> and so he'd replaced the, um, the sexual terms, you know, the stamen and the pistol, with you know, quite innocuous terms like chive and pointle. Uh, and he was much more popular in England at the time um, and he'd applied it to British plants as well so he'd compiled um, a classification system that not only was it kind of innocuous and kind of anglicised um, so it was, so it was uh, considered um, more proprietors for women botanists uh, but all the plants that he'd looked at were British plants as well so um, you can see how that kind of had more appeal within England at the time but the um, Erasmus Darwin, I suppose, was much more interested in the innovations that Linnaeus had made, and he wanted a true translation of Linnaeus that hadn't disguised, you know, the sexual parts of the flower, for example. Um, and he felt that people should should know about the innovations that Linnaeus had kind of introduced. And so their translations of Linnaeus, the Botanical Society at Lichfield, that was a huge kind of enterprise. Uh, and that was in some ways going to um, seize botany back from somebody like Lib Withering uh, and kind of, yeah, allow people to be, to fully engage with what Linnaeus had, um, had to say about botany really. I think Darwin was still very much ahead of his time in terms of, he was such a polymath. Um, in terms of the whole world of literature and science. I mean, it was before the onset of specialisation, so people did engage more broadly with science and literature. Um, you know, it's before that they kind of split off, in, split off into separate discourses in some way. But having said that, the fact that he was writing this botanical poetry, it did inspire a whole school of uh, writing by women. And so we get what we might call Darwiniana, where uh, women writers um, imitated the botanic garden um, and wrote, also wrote botanical poems in which they tried to be scientific as much as they could in, in regard to their education. Um, and so you get British, women, British writers like Charlotte Smith, for example, who was, who was more well known as a novelist, uh, attempting something along the lines of the botanic garden, but applying it again to British flora, 
there is some hesitation around her use of um, scientific terms. So quite often she'll revert back to the common names of plants. She will be a little bit shy or hesitant about using the Linnaean names, the scientific names of the plants. Um, so quite often um, the scientific information will be confined to footnotes as well, uh, rather than being in the main body of the poem. Um, I suppose it is an imitation of Darwin, but there's more of a kind of hesitancy. And also, within the women's poetry, they tended to emphasise the more chaste plants. <laughs> Those ones that could perhaps most um, represent virtue or polyg um, yeah, monogamy uh, in some ways. So they were a little bit um, hesitant about going as far as Darwin did in celebrating the more um, promiscuous plants.